Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. I have been studying relationships for over 20 years as a couples therapist, a professor, an award-winning author, and as a wife, mother, daughter, sister, and friend. Now, I'm inviting you into this space each week as I dig into some of the toughest and most fascinating relational dilemmas of our time. If you want to discover how to create vibrant and loving relationships in your own life, you have come to the right place. This is Reimagining Love. Hello, dear listener. I am really happy to share a conversation with you today that delves into this important crossroads that all of us are navigating. As we often explore here on Reimagining Love, cultural expectations around how women and men, quote unquote, should behave and react and live are rigid and narrow and deeply entrenched in our psyches. Here's one small example. When our son was in fourth grade, he was experiencing a conflict with some of the boys in his class, and his teacher referred to it as, quote unquote, girly girl behavior. So in one fell swoop, she invalidated the boys' feelings and reinforced the stereotype that girls are overly emotional. Unpacking and exploring gender dynamics is definitely one of my passions. Fun fact, I have not one, but two degrees in the subject, but I also at times find it really challenging to talk about masculine and feminine socialization in ways that don't essentialize sex and gender and in ways that are inclusive of all of us who are gender non-conforming. So I loved having a partner in crime, and that is today's guest, Danae Logan. Her 2024 book, Sovereign Love, A Guide to Healing Relationships by Reclaiming the Masculine and Feminine Within, explores what her experiences as a marriage and family therapist and a spiritual teacher have revealed about the nature of the feminine and the masculine energetics within all of us. Danae inspects these intrapsychic truths from the lens of depth psychology, which is often called the psychology of the soul. She observes the wounded feminine and masculine aspects so many of us carry and considers how we can move toward a healthy polarity between our own and our partner's energies. Danae guides clients, and in fact, all of us on today's episode, in finding that space that fulfills our own needs while also cherishing and nurturing relationships that let our energies flow into each other through understanding and self-awareness and appreciation. Danae and I also contemplate together the challenges that men and women face due to those cultural and social gender expectations. We all foster a fear somewhere beneath the surface that we're not going to be desirable enough or that we're not going to be chosen if we're not the right kind of man or the right kind of woman. These fears are seeded the first moment a boy is told to man up or a girl is told to speak more softly. And they continue to burrow roots deep in our souls as we grow unless we do the work to unearth and inspect and overthrow them. In this episode, Danae and I also get a chance to address a listener question from a survivor of prostate cancer who is experiencing barriers as he tries to reignite intimacy with his wife. His experience is a difficult and resonant example of why we need to understand our unique core masculine and feminine energetics and nurture our own containment of self, even as we strive to find solace in our partner. Join me in experiencing and learning from Danae's passion and her deep knowledge of how we come together, both in the ways we differ and the ways that we are the same. Whether you are coupled or single or somewhere in between, her insights are going to speak to the energetics that live in all of us, guiding us in further strengthening the bond with ourselves and our partners. Enjoy. 
Danae, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me on Reimagining Love. I could not be more honored and grateful to be here with you. Thank you for having me. (laughs) There's a ridiculous amount of overlap and synergy and (laughs) the work that each of us do and how we see and frame things. So I can't wait to get like super nerdy with you for my (laughs) own, for my own delight, but also because the Reimagining Love listeners, like this is just like such the bullseye of the conversations that I know people who turn to the show love to have. So we've got lots of fertile ground to cover. I'm excited. Yes, absolutely. I feel like as I listened to you and I was in a deep whole of your podcast this weekend, just episode after episode. Um, And I feel like you just, you speak the language so clearly and I'm like, God, she so gets it. I'm really (laughs) excited to geek out a little bit. Good. Okay. So before, before we go there, I want to learn a little bit more about you and ask you the reimagining love question that I ask all of the guests on the show. So are you ready for that? Sure. Yeah. All right, Danae. So how are you reimagining love in one of your important relationships these days? I love this question. I think I am reimagining how many ways there are to solidify what it means to have a secure attachment. And I think that that is something that's really been shifting and formulated with my child's father over the last four and a half, almost five years. And I say a lot of times that our relationship changed form from a marriage. We were almost married for almost um, 12 years and it's since transitioned into a friendship. But I had this moment where, you know, we were dropping off our seven-year-old for camp the other day and it was like he could hear in my voice as I was telling him something that I was overwhelmed. I was going to do something from work and I was kind of cutting it tight. And he showed up and it was just like this moment of like, I could tell that you were overwhelmed. He was so like in this space of attunement with me. And he was like, go ahead, I got it. I'll wait in line while you go. And I was like, God, you know, there's all these ways that we think about what a secure attachment looks like. But if my relationship with him and our friendship is not just such an example of how a secure attachment can show up in so many different forms, I don't know what is. And I just felt so blessed to have him in my life, but certainly have this as a model of what is possible if we just are willing to, as you speak to, reimagine what all of these dynamics can look like, you know? We do, we make a mistake when we say that marriages are secure attachments and divorces are insecure attachments. And I love that you are just in that little glimpse into the window. You're saying, no, that's not how it works. The secure attachment is something that we can create no matter, like the quality of the attachment is separate from the form that the relationship takes. Those are not one and the same. Those are not interchangeable. Mm, Absolutely. So can you, I mean, this is like a huge question, but what are, is there a little glimpse you can give us into how the two of you have gotten there? Like what has helped the two of you create the kind of secure attachment that you have today where he can just read, he mm. can just feel your, feel your energy, attune to it, and then make an accommodation like that? Yeah, you know, I think it was such an interesting thing when we decided that um, our relationship in its current form in the form of a marriage was expiring and that it needed to change form. And I think both of us were so committed to how can this not be the thing that is um, the thing that our child has to get over in his childhood. Like the really difficult thing about childhood was my parents not being in a marriage container. And so that sort of became the North Star. And I remember very shortly after we made the decision to separate, um, just, you know, sort of sitting, I think I was actually laying in my child's bed with him one night and feeling a lot of fear and, and saying, okay, Danae, so that's the voice of fear. You hear it loud and clear, you know, I'm going to be alone forever. I'm going to be a single mom. That was not my intention. All of these things coming to the surface. And all of a sudden a voice within me said somewhere, um, and what would love say about this? And I remember, you know, I I lost a friend um, to cancer just a few months before we decided to separate. So I, that was really present for me, that loss. And I remember thinking, well, he's not leaving his body. You know, he's he's still here with me. Our love is changing form, but maybe I could love him better as a friend than I loved him as a partner. And maybe I make that the goal, you know, to really want him to have a life that feels... Um, honest and fulfilling. And I think that, you know, he wants the same for me. And if I sort of make decisions from that space, what would love say about this? 
then it sort of shifted my perspective over and over. And so when he had his first you know, person that he was dating and he sort of asked about like bringing her over to meet me so that our child could be around her. You know, I had a, that moment of fear again that sort of kicked in and it was like, okay, well, what would love say? You know, and love said, it is going to be so much easier for your child in this dynamic if you figure out a way to love her. And so that was the decision I made. I was going to like really attempt to like get to know her well and love her well. And they've since broken up and I kept her. I adore her. She's still like, <laughs> she's really yours. Friend in my life. <laughs> I'm like, she's mine now. I'll keep her. Um, but I think that's sort of been the thing that we come back to. And it requires a lot of the same tools that I utilize with couples and that I ask them to speak to in terms of, you know, owning their 100% and really taking a deep breath and checking in with the story that they're telling themselves. But that work has continued into our friendship. And I think it's, I think we've done a pretty good job of um, really transitioning into something that feels like an expansion of our love versus a diminishment of it. Oh, that's really beautiful. That's really beautiful. That's, a really powerful North Star of, uh, you know, and it, and it is, I mean, the, you know, one thing that I, I loved about your book is the way that you seamlessly toggle between the intra-psychic, what's happening inside of me, the interpersonal, what's happening between the partners, and then the cultural backdrop that frames the whole thing. Like that's, I was like, oh, she's a woman after my own heart. This is a soul <laughs> sister. Like we're widening, we're tightening. Like that is just, and so even just in the story, right? Like the backdrop of divorce, I mean, the story that I grew up with, right? Is that divorce equals trauma, divorce equals equals failure. Divorce equals something that a child has to get over. And your North Star became, what if that's not, what if that's a story? What if that's not what it has to be? And so you let, you, you insisted, in fact, it sounds like by being guided by something other than the fear loaded story that the culture gave you. Yeah. And I think that it's really easy for that to be the thing that keeps us in dynamics that aren't really serving anyone. You know, I think so often that is the first response with clients across the board when a relationship is changing or needs to end. I feel like I've failed. You know, I think I've even had clients say their parents said something to them like, I just feel like a failure that my daughter couldn't stay married, you know, and that it's like, it's not even just my right. failure. It's right. sort of right. the family system. You disrupted failure. the whole family. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of pressure and weight to carry. And a lot of times it's exactly what you said. And is it true? What else could be true other than someone has failed here? You know, but it's also not, you speak to this in the book. It's, you're not anti-relationship. It's not like the flip is true or there's a flippancy about marriage or a kind of like take it or leave it with marriage. There's, that's not, it's not like we are either beholden to fight for every single marriage or we don't care about marriage. Like it's, there are more positions besides just those two poles. There's lots of shades of gray. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I studied Jungian psychology in grad school. And I think Jung talked about this thing of like the tension of the opposites and that we can hold multiple truths at the same time. And I think in so many ways, I feel like my marriage changing form has brought a deeper level of reverence for marriage and how we hold it as sacred and that it's not promised. And what if I showed up to this relationship dynamic every day as a gift that I am not entitled to, a choice that I am making consciously. But, you know, I remember feeling like, okay, well, so I'm a couples therapist and my marriage is ending. That <laughs> feels kind of <laughs> awkward initially. And then I said, well, that's a limiting belief that I can, you know, choose to stay in, or I could say, this gives me a little bit of an opportunity to step back and see some things that maybe I couldn't see up close when I was in a marriage that I'm able to see with a little bit of a different perspective. Um, and I'm not so afraid of the marriage ending. So I really do, when I'm working with couples, want what is best for the relationship dynamic and what will be in alignment with both of us thriving. And sometimes that's for the relationship to change form, but sometimes that's for us to you know, bring in some different variables that really offer a sense of pattern interruption and how might we view this differently. But I think it's given me a little bit more room to play than I had when I was sometimes like defending against some of the things I didn't want to see in my own relationship dynamic. That's really interesting. Yeah. Cause that, that is, that is a very simplistic story that a couple's therapist who's been divorced is somehow less. I, I remember that, I remember having a moment in grad school where we were doing 
was working on a research project and it was, you know, testing a model of therapy and the model of therapy, you know, the, the way the research was designed was if the couple stayed together, it proved the, you know, treatment model worked. And if the couple divorced, that was viewed as a failed outcome. So even, even within Right. It's really evident within our field that we do hold that bias that a good treatment outcome is staying together and a bad treatment outcome is divorce. And that is, it's too simplistic. And I think that we are, like, I think there's been quite a bit of evolution in our field, but that's, you know, that's our history. Like that's our lineage within the world of, of couples therapy, certainly. I feel like I've been on a little bit of a mission to change that. And something I've heard you speak to is certainly over the last few years, there's been so much challenging of our institutions and just disruption with the pandemic, all of the ways that we were doing life that, you know, I've had so many couples that I've worked with for a short time as a couple or in a partnership. And then a lot of the work has been, how do we allow this relationship to change form in a way that is still, you know, really honoring of who we want to be as Mm co-parents? I feel Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. it's been a little bit of both. So, and what's been really fascinating is I've had so many couples that early in the pandemic separated or decided that their relationship was going to end. And then with a little bit of distance, Hmm. they've actually come back together Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. there's Mm -hmm. been Mm -hmm. ways that I just saw some things that I couldn't see when we were like in this tight container attempting to make it work, you know. So you recently published your first book and it's called Sovereign Love, A Guide to Healing Relationships by Reclaiming the Masculine and Feminine Within. So before we get into the heart of the book, I would just love to hear you speak to a little bit about what it's been like having this book out in the world and what has stood out to you most about having shared this piece of art that you have created and offered. Like what's it been like to have it out there? I love that question, especially from you. I think um, because you know a little bit about what that process is <laughs> like of having something that's so close to your heart and you've poured so much of yourself into. And it at first is a little bit vulnerable to you. I feel like your baby is out in the world and how is this going to be received? And I feel like I've been so inspired by how ready I feel like we are collectively to have a little bit of a different conversation about love. And it just feels feels like things are really shifting. It feels like an exciting time to be alive to me. And I feel like it's been received in a way that, you know, so much of what I was feeling, I think this is always the case. I was not alone in feeling what I was feeling and people have really reflected that. And so that's just been such a gift to feel like, um, you know, this is a little bit my idea of like tangibly how to do some of the work of healing what I feel like we're at a crossroads with the way that we're doing love and relationships. And this is sort of like, well, here's my philosophy on uh-huh, how uh-huh, we can approach uh-huh. doing it a little bit differently. Yeah. When I first when I first saw your subtitle, um, Reclaiming the Masculine and Feminine Within, I was like, oh, sh- oh, she's going there. Oh, she's going there. Okay. <laughs> like, let's uh-huh. go for it. So, so I want you to talk about your framing, which is around, it really does pull from your study of Carl Jung and masculine and feminine energies and that these are these are not just tied to the bodies that we live in these are part of these are facets of the human experience so can you talk a little bit about what you mean when you talk about healthy feminine energy healthy masculine energy wounded feminine energy and wounded masculine energy Yes, absolutely. So as you just mentioned, these energetics are alive within all of us. They are not gendered. And although I do get into an exploration of the way that we've been socialized around gender in the book, so much of what you know was the catalyst for me really being curious about the exploration of these energetics within all of us was that Carl Jung was sort of the first person in terms of psychology to speak to these masculine and feminine dynamics that are alive within all of us. But, you know, there's just all of these different ways that we speak to these energetics, whether it's yin, yang, dark light. Um, Even when we, you know, and I've sort of become so obsessed that I see them in everything, even when we're talking about like pursuer distance or dynamics or anxious avoidance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that one person is sort of 
a little bit more um, find safety in connecting. One person finds a little bit more safety in detaching. They're always there. But um, Jung was sort of the first person to speak to the fact that all of us have masculine and feminine energetics. And he called the masculine elements within a woman the animus and the feminine elements within a man the anima. We've since really come to understand they're a lot more nuanced than the way that Jung was speaking to them. But that core um, tenant that these energetics are there is the through line. And I wasn't actually super interested in them when I was in grad school. But then when I sat down with couples, what I realized was, oh, this is what's happening. We're sort of believing that another person is going to give me those energetics that I don't have within myself or whatever I believe that I am lacking within. I'm looking for that other person to complete that. And we're competing for energy a little bit. And so once I started understanding like how energy works and that we're all energetic beings, and that was sort of the thing that nobody was really speaking to from my perspective in terms of couples work. I was like, if we can just understand how taking responsibility for my energy or even understanding what's happening inside of me energetically shifts the dynamic between us, then it becomes like a whole different ball game in terms of how we're interacting with one another. But first, we really have to understand that for so many years, we've been living in a really wounded masculine paradigm. And I think I always like to speak of them in terms of wounding or distorted energetics, because a lot of times what we think of as masculine and feminine energetics are not the healthy versions of those energetics within us. In a lot of ways, we don't have a lot of models of what that even looks like, right? So, and you know, it's so interesting. (laughs) I heard you at Sessions Live years ago speaking about, you said something about you know, our grandparents' grandparents model of love and relationships just is not going to cut it. It's not going to work moving forward. And as I started to think about, yeah, I think that's really true. But what was what it looked like in terms of the relationship energetics for our grandparents' grandparents? And what I realized was if we look at these institutions or even like the root of patriarchy and what it looked like in the beginning, there was so much about the suppression of the feminine energetics within all of us, regardless of how we identify in terms of gender, that was really necessary in terms of cultivating a dominance-based structure. And we've never had a reckoning with that. We've never sort of gone back and said, here's how we do the cleanup work around some of what was passed down to us from our mothers around what they understood they needed to do and be in relationships to keep themselves safe and how we're still sort of playing out some of those models, certainly from like the 50s and 60s. And if you think about just the fact that women didn't even have their own bank accounts or credit cards until like 1974, ago. that impacts mm-hmm. how we are competing for energy mm-hmm. in our partnerships mm-hmm. and you know power dynamics and attempting to keep ourselves safe, right? So it's like we have to talk about all of. We have to talk about to all understand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And when you say that we've been operating on a wounded from a wounded masculine frame, I mean you're talking about even everything from colonization to like that is all right. That dominance base that where we have to where the collective right there's a collective of this group dominating this group and owning this group and managing this group. And all, so it's it's that, and then it's, it's, it's between the sexes and then it is right within the home. So it is all of those kind of layers of what happens when we prioritize, even capitalism, right? When we prioritize profit and production, which are important. They're, those are, it is important to produce. It is important, you know, to, to create product. It is important to have an economic system. But when that is out of balance with other elements, cultivation and care, that's what you're talking about in terms of a wounded, a culture that has been dominated by wounded masculine energy, which does not mean that men have done this, right? It's we, it's all of us. It's all of us. So important. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, speaking to it in the form of dominance is really important because a lot of times, even today, when I say the word patriarchy, I feel like people think that that equates to me speaking about men. And I just want to be so clear. Patriarchy is not men. They are not synonymous with one another at all. And in fact, you know, there's so many ways that a patriarchal structure has been deeply damaging to men and really um, suppressed the fullest expression of their humanity in ways that I think it's really important for us to start talking about as well. So I think we do have to talk about, you know, the dominance that has been present, but also understanding 
this is all of us. This is, you know, the rise of the feminine, which is a lot of what I talk about in terms of where I think we are coming into the space of a little bit more of a balanced model. I'm talking about the rise of the feminine energetic within all of us, regardless of gender. Right. Which is not replacing men with women. It's not flipping the paradigm. It's not saying that women have been perfect, you know, in all of this. So it's it's none of that. It is saying, right, that there's a, a quality of energy that we all need to have to experience the fullest expression of ourselves, right? Of our humanity. And then to relate to each other from a place of wholeness rather than wound. What you keep referring to is competition for energy, right? Or if I can't, if I'm not able to, I'm looking at the, you have this beautiful chart. I love, I love a good chart. So I'm looking at kind of like the masculine energy. If I'm not able to guide, like to seek mentorship. If I'm not able to do that, I'm going to be kind of reaching for somebody else to do it. I'm going to be borrowing that from my partner if I don't feel able to do that on my own. Absolutely. So, you know, when I think about like the core desires of the masculine and the feminine energetic, and so while we all have these energetics within us, each of us have for the most part, a core energetic. Um, And I can normally (laughs) tell when I sit with someone um, what their core energetic is, but it has a lot to do with like your energetic essence, the way that you long to be seen and met and um, certainly an intimacy, like some of what comes forward for you. But the core masculine's longing, I think fundamentally is to be trusted and to be in the space of like, I believe in you and I'm confident in who you are. Um, And then the core desire of like a feminine is to be seen and to be witnessed. And this is the space of like what causes an authentic sense of life force and arousal in each of these core energetics. And so if I am looking for someone outside of me to see me, a lot of times what ends up happening, especially in our relationship dynamics when we've been together for a long time, I get to the space of like, I feel like you're not seeing me and I almost am like demanding energetically that you see me, right? And if, you know, we're speaking about a core masculine, it's like, I feel like you don't trust me. I feel like you don't believe in me. And I'm sort of like in that space of resentment that you don't feel that. And, you know, what we start to realize is that none of us come to this space of shifting the dynamics between us when we're in the space of demanding it. But if I shift my energy, we inevitably create polarity in our relationships. It's just what happens. And so if I really say, but am I seeing me? If I'm really looking for my partner to see me and validate me and make me feel safe, my work becomes, am I doing that for me? Am I really in the space of wholeheartedly believing in who I am and facing some of these existential fears and doing that work for myself? And then my partner will inevitably be in that space of a little bit of vulnerability, a little bit more of like, you know, and it's sort of a dance back and forth as you speak to so often, these energetics are not fixed. So regardless of what our core energetic is, we will all be embodying both wounded masculine and feminine energetics. We'll sort of do this dance back and forth, but our work is really to determine where I am energetically so that I can take responsibility for my energy. What is healthy polarity? So you talk about, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so tell us about, tell us about that. Like what is, what's the vision for healthy polarity? So the goal is not for all of us to squash these energies or these pulls. The goal is to kind of have them be able to flow differently within us and between ourselves and our partners. So how, tell us about healthy polarity. Yeah. And here's the thing that I think, and this is why when I was seeing these energetics come to life, I was like, it's kind of hard to talk about because this is to me the ultimate multiple things can be true at one time. Uh Meaning Uh there is something that happens to us as a core feminine woman when little things, like I have yet to meet a woman where if a man says something like, hey, I got you from like the deepest sense of himself. And he is in that like protective containment energy. There isn't something that's like, oh, that feels really, really good. That like energetic of masculine leadership and certainty to a core feminine woman just feels really safe and arousing and all of these good things, right? That is true. And at the same time, there's a way that if I am looking for that from a man and I'm believing that I need that in order to be whole, that becomes sort of a distortion or like a outsourcing of my power. So it's like, can I hold both truths at the same time? I think when I do the work and a lot of what I talk about in the book is how to integrate these energetics within ourselves so that when I am 
you know, in that space of my healthy feminine and I am able to reclaim that energy for myself, but I also know how to be my own masculine fierce protector and be confident in who I am, then I am not looking for someone to complete me. But when someone comes into my life, it becomes that really beautiful balance of those energetics between the two of us because we're just sort of pouring into one another from the overflow versus looking for someone to fill my cup because I believe that I don't have the ability to do it for myself. Ooh, it is so subtle and it's so important. I'm like flashing on so many couples therapy (laughs) sessions and so many moments (laughs) in my own marriage. Like that is so true, right? And it does, like every road leads back to how am I sourcing that within myself? Because if my belief is my needs aren't getting met in this relationship, if that's my belief, then I'm just I'm just scanning for evidence that you aren't centering me, that you aren't prioritizing me, that you aren't seeing me, that you aren't valuing me, right? Versus, of course, I want to be seen and valued. And I know that I have a responsibility to do that for myself as well. And what I love about it is there's a way that we create energy with what we believe to be true, which is what I hear a lot of in what you're saying. You know, one of my friends always says, what you appreciate appreciates. And I think that's really true in our relationship dynamics. And I think that if I am looking for ways that my partner is not meeting me, seeing me, validating me, I will find them. And that will sort of be the energetic between us that gets bigger. But if I really seek out ways that I am just so unbelievably fortunate to have this person in my life and I highlight the things that they are doing so unbelievably well and celebrate those things. It's just the way that we're sort of built. Like all of a sudden your partner's like, oh, you like that? You want some more of that? Let me support you with that. But, you know, one of my favorite spiritual teachers, Wayne Dyer, used to say, see the light in others and treat them as if that's all that you see. And I think that when we're looking for what is this person's strength and, you know, holding with reverence the truth of who they are, that is the thing that gets bigger, not only within them and the way they show up, but in our perception of them. And all of a sudden we start to feel really differently about our relationship dynamic than when we're sort of looking for what isn't going well. On that idea, when it is a cis hetero couple and I'm asking her to do that because it feels like what I'm, it feels like what I'm saying is, you know, do more, like do more pumping him up, do more inflating him. You know, it's a, it's a really sneaky line between appreciation and sort of like whatever, soothing the male ego. You know, it feels like it's, there's, there's a, an element there that I, I have a hard time you know, that, that is, that I think can be, can feel like a difficult transition to help a woman make. Yeah. And, you know, here's the thing, a couple of things. I'm, and yes, I feel that all the time as well with my sisters. And I think there's this thing of, you know, that old couples therapy adage, do you want to be right? Or do you want to have a relationship? Right? Like, so I, <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. fair, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times what I will say to a woman in heteronormative dynamics when she's in that space that you're describing is, well, tell me about when this dynamic between the two of you started, right? Like, did this just start recently? And it's like, no, he was always like this. And so when did you think that this was going to shift? Like, how did you think that this dynamic was going to be different? And a little bit, I say that to say, I think the feminine is the energetic that always is in this space of expansion and can see the big picture and can see where this can go. The masculine tends to be a little bit more linear and it's like problem solution. If it's not broken, like leave it alone, right? And so a lot of times the way that, you know, and I don't want to like minimize this in terms of gender because this is true and regardless, but I think a lot of times if you show up in one way in your relationship dynamic in the beginning, your partner experiences that as like, that's just who you are. Where I find a lot of times it's especially like an over-functioner, under-functioner dynamics. It's like the over-functioner is pouring love into someone else, doing all of this work, all of this effort, thinking that that person will understand like, this is how I long to be loved. I would like you to give this back to me. But that other person is sort of like, oh, I just think that's who you are. Mm-hmm. And I just mm-hmm. think that this mm-hmm. is These are the rules of engagement. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> exactly. Uh-huh. And so it's like, we have to take a lot of responsibility for the person that we chose, the way that they showed up. And if we want this relationship dynamic to be different, resentment will never get us there. But I think there's a lot of 
ownership that we have to take sometimes as women for, and again, this isn't our fault because so much of what our cultural conditioning teaches us is that the worst thing we can be, especially as women, is unpartnered. And so it's like sometimes in order to seal the deal and lock this relationship down, we didn't use a ton of discernment in terms of do we have a shared vision in terms of what a relationship dynamic will look like, what the shared, you know, responsibilities will be, all of those different things. And then it's like, we kind of want to change the rules a few years into a marriage and it just doesn't necessarily work that way, you know? I mean, there again, right, you are inviting, it's not about the individual woman who quote unquote chose wrong. It is about a woman who has been a very, very good listener and a very diligent you know, student of the cultural messages. And that is, you write about the core, kind of core collective fear of women is the fear of abandonment, the fear of being alone, the fear of being not chosen. And the core wound of men is the fear of being shamed, the fear of being confused, the fear of being shown to be wrong or misguided or not knowing the answer. Yes, absolutely. And I think I didn't, that was something I didn't realize until I started working with men was how much there is like this, deep rooted fear in men that not having the answer or not knowing equates to weakness. And I didn't realize that men are conditioned to think that that equates to you being weak or somehow not being man enough. And that masculinity is something that men have to be in this constant state of performing and sort of armoring up to show that they're enough of a man. And I think that there's just so many ways that we are missing one another because we don't understand from the other person's perspective in our relationship dynamics, what it feels like to move through the world. And I think there are all of these ways that, you know, men are really conditioned to believe it's just, she doesn't want you to be weak. She wants you to be strong and stoic and just keep her happy, happy wife, happy life is like nails on a chalkboard. That phrase to me is like, yeah, stop. Um, But then also so many of us got messaging from our mothers as women who were attempting to teach us to be strong feminists, God bless them, but that, you know, don't trust a man, don't put all your faith in a man, make sure that you, you know, got your own back, all of these things that when we come into a relationship dynamic are really sort of adversarial energetics that are happening between us, but we've never really thought about how do we put down our armored guards and really, you know, from the space of our our souls say, what has this been like for you? I truly am hungry to understand. Right. It's such a miss. I mean, I, I see it all the time. Like I remember when our son was like fourth grade, there was some conflict that he had with some classmates and the, the fourth grade teacher who was a woman said, you know, it's just these boys are having some of that, you know, some of that classic girly girl problem, like meaning that they were like, because these boys were in their feelings, they were acting like girls. Like it was the idea that, you know, that men, that boys are simple and boys don't have strong emotions and boys don't have complicated emotions. So it is like from a very early age, we all collectively participate in this idea that men are emotionally shut down and they're simple. And if they're having feelings, they're being girls. And, you know, just, it's just like ridiculous. And then, right. And then we enter our marriages without that deep, deep curiosity for those of us who have married across gender, without that deep curiosity of like, help, like, what is it like for you when you don't know? What is it like for you when I ask you a question? We hear from so many women about their husband's defensiveness. You know, he's so defensive. And when you tie it to that fear of not knowing, defensiveness makes sense because the defensiveness is, no, 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 no. Don't look over here at this thing that I don't quite have managed, you know? I don't have quite have the answer to. So defensiveness makes sense in that context. But if we can't be curious about what socialization has done to the other, then we're going to miss all of that. Absolutely. And even if you think about what the energetic of being witnessed in vulnerability is, that is the energetic of the feminine. And so there's a way that we condition men to suppress their feminine energetic so early and that those aspects of themselves are something that they should feel shame about. And I think it's just really difficult to attempt to be in intimacy with another person. You know, intimacy is sort of that intimacy when there's all of these aspects of myself that I'm defending against you seeing because I've been culturally conditioned to. Mm-hmm. 
So a moment ago, you um, cited your your nails on the chalkboard of happy wife, <laughs> happy life, and I I love it. I, I saw I read it in the book where you use an example of a couple where that was kind of his operating motto was happy wife, happy life, and you break it down. And I love that because I like I've done entire episodes on like a little cultural phrase, like where you just take this like super packed little phrase, like if they wanted to, they would, or right person, wrong time, and then you just like expand it into like a whole episode. I like love doing that. So I would love for you to do that. Like give us your take on what is the problem? Like what does the happy wife, happy life adage, what does it tell us? Like what does it convey? And then what is the problem with it? Or how does that keep us stuck? You spoke to a little bit in that beautiful example with your son. I think there's a way that we socialize men to believe that that their emotional landscape is any way less complex and nuanced and something to be explored in the way that we do and we are really socialized to do as women. I think there's there's so much about, you know, little girls are just conditions from so young to be in the exploration of self and what does this mean? <laughs> We're all sort of like <laughs> what we do in therapy is like really normal, you know, <laughs> conditioning for little girls, but not so much for little boys. If you watch the way that they're conditioned to interact with one another, and I love that you have sons because there's so many things that I would watch with my little boy that I'd be like, oh God, he's just so tender with his little friends. And they're just so like, let's hold hands as we cross the street and hug each other and give each other kisses and all of these things that I started to realize, you know, Bell Hooks talks about normalized traumatization of little boys and that there's just a way that we teach little boys, you know, if there's like a co-ed baseball team, you'll see sometimes like if a little girl has a difficult time, the coach will get down on her level and they'll say, you know, they'll like validate what she's feeling. But then the little boys will sort of say like, suck it up. You know, it was, it was a tough run. Get back in there. You're okay. Right. And there's a way that this impacts men in so many ways that we're never curious about. It's like in that moment, that little girl gets to like express and feel something and be in those emotions and that is normalized and that little boy learns to start pushing them down. And, you know, we never think about like what happens when we push those emotions down, where do they go? And I often give the example of a beach ball that we push underwater. It's like we're holding it down for a really long time. We use all of our strength and eventually when it comes to the surface, it feels like like this big, you know, explosion of emotions. But I think that's men in society and I'm so struck by how nobody's talking about there's all these ways that men carry like a low level resentment around the emotions that they're not able to express and feel. I think it shows up in their relationships so often. I think it shows up collectively in the way that we see men hurting, that the majority of violent crimes are committed by men, that men, white cis hetero men die by suicide at higher rates than any other part of the population. Like we can't continue to pretend like a patriarchal framework is actually serving men. And so I think this thing of just like pretending like men, you know, a lot of times when they come in for couples therapy, it's normally the wife that's like, I just want him to open up. I just want him to be here and be present with me and talk to me about what's going on with him. And I I like to say, you know, he has been socialized for a lifetime not to do that. It's sort of like you're saying to him, go fly that jet, like go outside and fly that jet real quick. I mean, he's like, I don't know how to fly a jet. I've spent a lifetime time not being in touch with what I'm feeling, not knowing how to name that. And we're asking him to do that. So we've got to have a little bit of grace around that. But when men have the space and they really start to get into that space, it's like floodgates are open. And sometimes yeah. the wives are like, whoa, why did we... What have we done? <laughs> yeah, but it's it's mm-hmm. necessary. You know? Yeah. So the happy wife, happy life is an extension of that where he, it's not really, he's not even thinking about his own happiness, his own needs. He is a good husband to the degree that he manages her well-being. It's the natural product of everything he's been taught about his own emotional world is that his emotional world doesn't matter. Hers does. And then it also, I see it getting into this thing too, where women know when they're being managed. Women know when they're being told the answer that just is to avoid the problem or, you know, so, so that like happy wife, happy life ends up just driving them both into the ground because Right. His inner world is the beach ball analogy. It's coming out some way. And she knows that she's not getting something that is authentic or genuine from him. She's getting, he's watching her and he's 
and he's cueing off of her and he's trying to just manage her. And that's not intimacy either. Absolutely. What you just said, you know, I think it's not relational to me, I think is why the phrase just like really bothers me. It just feels like we're not actually in relationship with one another. And I remember after my marriage ended, I heard someone say this phrase that like, you know, when you hear something, you're like, oh, oh. Um, but it was like a patriarchal culture teaches women that a tolerable level of permanent unhappiness is what they should expect for their lives. And that's just like what's normalized. And I was thinking, Oof, that first of all is really what we're conditioned to believe, right? Like if you think about all of the responsibilities that women had in the 50s and 60s and how much more we've sort of added on to the plates of women who are most of the time doing just as much providing for the household as the men in heteronormative dynamics. And we sort of haven't given men a playbook for how to meet women um, in this space of what they've been doing in terms of like, yes, we've been developing. Um, so if we think about, let me back up for a second. If we think about that, we've sort of conditioned men to believe that they should be outsourcing their emotional world and their emotional language to the women in their lives. And women should be outsourcing their financial stability and all of those things to the men in their lives. That was sort of the framework previously. And now there's sort of been a shift in that women are sort of able to provide for themselves and provide for the household in a way that they weren't before, but there hasn't been a real blueprint for men in terms of what it looks like to catch up in some of this emotional landscape work and really knowing thyself well, right? And so I think there's just an imbalance that we need to figure out how to rectify in terms of, to me, that thing that you were speaking of before and how we're sort of in that space of resentment and just feeling like I don't want to coddle him and I don't want to be in this space of like validating him because that feels like I'm giving some part of me away. But I think the other part of that like tolerable level of permanent unhappiness is, and you get to be in righteous anger for it forever. And that's your payoff. And to me, I'm like, that doesn't really feel like the best payoff. Like I'd rather figure out a way to have some fulfillment and contentment. I think a lot of times the reclamation or the resistance to some of these layers of oppression or dominance are like, no, we're going to figure out a way to love our lives. <laughs> like you can't make us be miserable. And to me, that feels like so much more of an empowering form of resistance. Beautiful. Okay, let's take everything that we've talked about and speak to this listener because I think this is a beautiful, it was so, we had your interview scheduled and then this question came in and I was like, mm. oh, this is just a divine question to bring to Danae. It highlights so many mm. of the themes in your book. All right, our listener question is from Ken in Virginia and he uses he, him pronouns and he writes, I'm a 66-year-old male in a relationship for 26 years. In 2020, I received a diagnosis of prostate cancer that changed our sex life. I am cancer-free, but the trauma has made me feel emotionally vulnerable. I am aware of deteriorating satisfaction and quality in my marriage. I've sent podcasts and given her books about issues with sex and intimacy after cancer to my wife, but she seems to be a reluctant partner concerning relationship work. I feel like the needy one. When I've expressed my emotions, I feel shut down and have been told that I'm overreacting. You speak about men who've been conditioned to repress their emotions, and I relate to that, especially in my youth. However, I have done a lot of emotional work since then. I haven't heard much in your podcast or anywhere about women who repress their emotions. Do you have the experience with clients that have the opposite of the traditional dynamic of the man being more unable to enter into emotional intimacy work than the woman? Are there ways to work with this dynamic the same when traditional gender roles are reversed? First of all, just thank you for this question, Ken, because I feel like this is such a common dynamic that comes up with the couples that I work with. And I think, you know, there are a lot of our brothers who are doing a lot of work to understand and just such deep bows and want to give a shout out to the men who are really working to understand themselves well and shift some of these paradigms. You know, to me, this is one of those places where it's really important for us to acknowledge and name that what cultivates an authentic sense of arousal in men and women is not the same. And this is one of those places where we need to be able to speak to the difference. And again, that multiple truths can be there at the same time. Now, 
I find, and this is what's beautiful about understanding that these energetics we're speaking to are not fixed, that we can be in a dance, whether it's different periods in our life, different seasons. Here's a big place that this ends up showing up, I find with couples is maternal energy and you know mothering energy and really being in the space of caretaking is actually a very masculine role and i did not really have a sense of this until i had a child but it is very contain and keep safe and directive and i'm in charge and i got this energy right and so what i find is so many couples once a child enters the picture a woman ends up being so in her masculine a lot of times from a wounded space but so embodying sort of a masculine armor that it can be really difficult to penetrate that and the man in the dynamic ends up embodying a lot of that um, wounded feminine polarity where it's like, yeah, I want to connect. I feel like you've left me. I feel needy, but I want my wife back. All of these energetics that um, certainly can be challenging to talk about because it can feel a little bit in that space of what we're conditioned to think is emasculating for a man to be in that space. And so I think it can, like using the word abandonment, as you just did, can be really supportive under, of understanding the way it feels inside of me, right? Now, I think it's important to understand that like the core feminine woman, the state of arousal really has to come from being able to go inward and really be in a little bit more of an egocentric space. Whereas the masculine is sort of like that externalized, like they sort of feel aroused and like, is she into this? She looks great. Like whatever the experience of the other is, it's like, you know, even if you think about our anatomy, the Um, masculine is the external, the feminine is the internal. And so a lot of times in terms of our intimacy, women have so many additional inhibitors in terms of like finding that space of arousal. I'm my to-do list in my head, like the kids are in the other room, all of these other things. And so we can just sort of like armor up and not be in that space of like really being able to drop in and go inward. And I think that that thing of looking for her to see me, looking for her to like, you know, validate me and want me can really be that thing of a man like really looking for her to see him. And he's a little bit again in that feminine, wounded feminine energetics. So saying all this to say for Ken, I believe that your work becomes how do I come into like that healthy masculine containment of self? Like I got to have me first. And some of this is like, we really need to start collectively normalizing men do need more than just their wives. Um, We have so socialized, like your partner should be your everything, your confidant, your travel buddy, your erotic other. It's just, it's too much. And one person doesn't have the capacity for that. So I would love to see, like if I were working with with Ken and his wife, I would really want Ken to cultivate a sense of brotherhood and a sense of other people in his life that are sort of offering some of that release that he's looking to get from his wife. And then when I'm in the space of my own containment, I can really work to see her, to like invite her into that space of her healthy feminine getting back there, right? So whatever is on her plate that I would imagine maybe is making it a little bit challenging for her to drop into that space of going into the internal, really being present in her body, really being able to receive from Ken. If I am like more contained and I am in that like strong core, then she is able to soften into me because she knows I got me, right? Um, So the more that I can sort of cultivate some of that for me, then a little bit I can see her and I can be curious about her and she can feel safe being in that space of like, oh, Ken sees me again. And that makes me feel aroused as the feminine in our relationship Mm -hmm. dynamic. But I want to hear how Ooh, I know. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Yep. I, you know, we don't quite know what it, what Ken's post-cancer, post-prostate cancer journey looks like. I have wondered if perhaps he doesn't have the kind of reliable erections that he had had before. And certainly that is like when a couple, like especially a cis hetero couple, it is so easy to fall into that highly scripted, that sex is guided by his erection, you know, just kind of like everything kind of like, you know, drafts off of his erection, what's happening. Penetration is viewed as the goal, right? Everything we call foreplay is to get the bodies ready, you know, all of that. We've talked about on Reimagining Love before. And if that's, if they can't 
follow that same playbook post-cancer, they've got a challenge because now who are we sexually to each other? But it also is this really incredible opportunity of like, wait a minute, what do we get to create? Like we have this wide open canvas now where we have our whole entire bodies and we don't have to be whatever, however they have been goal oriented, you know, getting everybody hard and wet enough to have penetration. Like what kind of avenues do we get to go down now? But if what kind of weaving in what you were saying, if what Ken's wife is picking up on is that Ken needs a lot of reassurance that that's okay, then it might be confronting her own story. I think so many women also rely on his erection as her affirmation that she is desirable, that she is sexy. So she may have some feelings of her own about what this means to have, you know, perhaps not have that kind of cue and and clue that everything is okay in Ken's part of the world. And it may, that's a kind of demand for intimacy, right? If the two of us now are creating different kinds of experiences of touch and play and pleasure, that's a kind, that's a new intimacy threshold for the two of them. And she, I don't know what her journey was going through his cancer treatment, but if she was in that caregiving mode for Ken, that was probably a check the to-do list, make sure the meds are there. What's the next appointment, you know, and she may have some trauma and some kind of, you know, grief to do around that so that she can see Ken as well again and ready again and here again. She may have been really afraid of losing him, of course. And so, you know, here he is. And so she may need some support and witnessing around what she went through in that journey. Also, Ken, not that, not saying that you haven't offered her that, but just, you know, has she let that chapter be a bit more in the past and and can she open up to you again and, you know, see your health and vibrance coming through once again? That's such an important point because I think there's a way that we don't speak to, you know, how we as women can sort of get in those spaces of really, when we're afraid, armoring up to be strong for the people in our lives and that like, I'll be in that stoic space of like, I have to be strong for you and I don't get to, you know, be afraid because I don't want you to see that I feel afraid about losing you. And we can sort of like get stuck there a little bit and it can be hard to come back into that space of being vulnerable with you. So I just think what you just said is such a beautiful invitation back into the exploration of intimacy. Yeah. And that way there's like a real, potentially like a real sweetness here where they both are trying to protect each other. You know, he doesn't, I I hear that he's offering these resources and I love your point about making sure that Ken is really kind of feeling solid in his core so that when he's offering the resource, it is from a, from a healthy masculine place of like wanting to guide and be a bit of a leader in this process. Like, come on, we can do this. Like we can, you know, reclaim our sexual relationship and it's not going to look the same, but I, we got this, you know, if, if she can kind of feel that from him, she can maybe surrender to it a bit and kind of stretch that intimacy threshold a little bit from her end. Yeah, and just wanting to make sure that Ken's making space to really listen to what her journey has been through his cancer treatment and make sure that he's got a, a good sense of that. Okay, well, and Ken, of course, I mean, of course, like I feel like every listener question is like, okay, couples therapist or sex therapist, like of course <laughs> I want the two of you, you know, maybe, and it may be sometimes, you know, I think I often talk about the podcast or the book is the nice kind of entry point towards therapy, but Ken, it may be, it may be that just, Rather than offering resources, I wonder if she would go to therapy with you, if the two of you could partner up with a great couples therapist and start to unpack some of this together. Danae, this has been such a delight. Thank you. Thank oh my you. Thank gosh. you. I feel like I don't even have the words to express how grateful I am, certainly for the invitation to come and have this conversation with you. But even more than that, I feel like there are just women who have been such unbelievable pioneers in how we have these conversations about relationships. And I'm just really grateful for you and the way that you've shown up to do this work because it's been so much of what I am able to feel like, okay, it's safe to go there and it's safe to explore. It's because people like you and my teacher, um, Esther Perel, have really like been like 
the guiding lights and like, this is, no, you can do this. This is possible. And I just really appreciate you and the way that you show up for this work. So thank you. Well, I, I hope that this is the first of many collaborations because there's just so much beauty and integrity and depth in the work that you're offering to the world. So I'm really so impressed by you and grateful for you. So if people, if this is your first exposure listener to Danae Logan, tell us more, Danae, like where can people, so th- obviously you need to get this book. And so we've got links in the show notes for where to get the book. And we'll link to the indie booksellers that we always are wanting people to turn to. But how how else? What are other ways that people can get to know you more deeply? Uh, um, DanaeLogan.com. And then I'm on social media as Danae.Logan on all the the different socials. Great. And you have a podcast also called Cheaper Than Therapy. I do. Cheaper Than Therapy. Thank you for reminding me. Yes. And that that's um, another therapist friend and my podcast, Vanessa Bennett. And we do a little bit of like live coaching sessions and have some you know, people that we're really inspired by. And um, yeah, just talking about a little behind the scenes of the work of therapy as well. I love it. I love it. Great. Okay. Well, links to all of that in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you, Danae. Thank you so much. Thank you, Danae Logan, for partnering with me to explore the intricacies of our energetics and the importance of cultivating healthy core energetics to uplift both ourselves and our partners. Thank you also to our brave, seeking, reimagining love listener who shared his heartfelt story. Danae's book, Sovereign Love, has taught and inspired me in so many ways. I know that it would be a wonderful resource for you in your journey toward embracing the feminine and masculine in yourself and in your own relationships. You can find out more about Danae's work, her retreats, and her podcast, Cheaper Than Therapy, in the show notes. Until next time, be well. Reimagining Love is produced and edited by Mary Chan and Katie Pagich of Organized Sound Productions. Our theme music was composed by Slade Warnkin. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com, where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at Northwestern University. Thank you for listening and see you next week here on Reimagining Love.